Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to Trading Merlin Show. Sorry, I'm all delayed over here. It's a short week, and I've got just all kinds of stuff going on. Anyway, hope you had a, uh, a good President's Day, did something fun and exciting for your day off. Uh, just as a note, I am going to be traveling to Northern California Thursday and Friday, which means you're going to get this show and tomorrow, and that's it for the week. So I apologize for anybody who uh, is hanging their hat on me having a glass of whiskey on the Thursday show, or Friday show, but only going to do a Tuesday and, thir Tuesday and Wednesday this year because, man, this, this week because uh, I have Thursday and Friday as a travel day, and I won't be broadcasting while I'm driving. So we'll be back on Monday with the normal show. So uh, I thought I'd start off by going into what's plaguing me. As you guys know, I've been in that boil trade for a few weeks now, and I had a real solid plan in place. And as Mike Tyson says, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. And you know, having traded for 27 years, I've seen a lot of punches in the face, but this 34% decline in boil in just five trading sessions is nothing short of just absolutely incredible. Even cryptos don't have moves like that. I mean, just a straight free fall for five days in a row. Anyway, uh, let's walk through some of the comments I received. So I figured I'd address this one right off the bat. Oliver says, boil trade is getting beat. I'm sorry, Merlin. Hey, it's all part of the profession there, my friend. Naum says, how low can boil go? It's almost time to replenish the reserves. Yeah, well, that leads me to the final picture, which uh, thanks AI for taking a picture. And I said, give me one that says surrendering white flag. This is probably the one of the better AI pictures. I do feel a little bit old, like I look like a Ukrainian war general right now. But uh, I guess the visual represents what I'm trying to convey here, which is when to surrender on a trade. Now, let me go back and discuss what the initial plan was for my part and kind of how I was going to manage this trade going down. If you look at the natural gas chart, which I'll bring up here for everybody to look at and uh, watch your jaws hit the floor. Where did it go? There's natural gas. Natural gas, by the way, was down over 10% again today. Uh, it was down 9 at the final close, but at one point it was over 10%. So when I got into this trade, I was looking at this chart here. I was not in it yet, and I was looking at it uh, just kind of in this really aggressive decline. Zoomed out, and I thought right in this area right here is where I thought we'd see a little bit of a bounce. That goes to that 270 mark, right? So it was a little bit lower than where I was at, and I sold the, the puts. Now, I didn't do the puts on natural gas because I don't trade options on futures. I did it on UNG, which is the underlier. So that same level would have been back up here right around 9 Right. And then um, because I wanted a little extra firepower, because given how bad this thing was just bleeding out here, I was anticipating there being a fairly sharp bounce with this one. So I went with boil instead. Oops. How about I spell it right? Boil. So I did the seven dollar boils, which, you know, coincide. Actually, this may not even have it because this is, doesn't have that kind of history. Um, but as it came down to the seven, what I did is I took the ATR. Now, we you know one of the things that we looked at with the turtles is part of the way that they determine their stop loss is they look at something that's trending and they go two times the ATR. Well, at the time that I made this trade, looking to sell the puts on boil at $7, the ATR was two bucks. It's actually 204. And I thought, well, man, I don't think, I actually thought it was gonna slide down a little bit more. I thought we'd see a traverse sideways base and then slowly start to move to the upside. Instead, it's just been these up. Actually, it's been fairly close except for the last five days. So a two dollar eighty uh, two oh six stop loss on a seven dollar boil would have given me a stop loss of four dollars and ninety six cents. So as we went into the weekend on this one, I didn't like it for a couple reasons. Number one, let me get this moving average off of here because I will not be needing the moving average. Number one on boil and the same thing on natural gas. I could draw this chart on both of them, but you have this kind of just condensed range. So I hit my seven, dropped a little bit and kind of bounced between 550 and seven bucks. I was like, okay, fine. That's kind of the basing that I was looking for. Thought we might actually see it go sideways for a bit, start to break out to the upside after it consolidated after such a long fall. It didn't. And on Friday, I was torn. I really wanted to exit the positions because it was very close to my stop loss. Uh, but again, I'm selling premium against this. So I was like, okay, if it opens up on Monday, I'll, I'll look at selling premium. Now, it opened up this morning, as you can see, significantly lower. It actually dropped below my stop loss, which was uh, 496. But again, I had collected some premiums so that should lower that stop loss. Now, the problem I had was I would have been okay holding this if I could continue to sell 
premium at this $7 strike, but there's nothing of the $7 strike. There's pretty much nothing at the $6 strike either. So in lieu of that, the fact I couldn't generate any more premium on this thing as it's just in free fall, I dumped it this morning. So good news is I'm out. Uh, the bad news is, you know, if there is the big pop, which I believe it will come, I just don't know when. And, you know, I was looking at this chart on natural gas. Let me look at it a little bit further here. You know, $2 is the logical stopping point, number one, right? So we have a couple little levels here that I was looking at. I'll put these red lines on where I thought we might slow down or stop. Let's go put two on here. So this, you know, $1.33 mark was kind of the base this two-week consolidation, which I was fine with. Great, just traverse sideways, let me sell call options against my position. That I would love for that to happen. And this is the beauty of options, right? I, I wasn't really losing anything here as it traversed sideways. I was actually making money. If it rallied up, okay, I would have lost um, what I would have initially, uh, I would have lost any gains above my strike price on the call, no big deal. The only way I really get burned is if this thing keeps on tanking and it's exactly what it did. So look at the price of natural gas just in four trading sessions. From peak to trough, it's fallen 21%. Now, I don't think that that's going to last very long, but again, the markets can remain irrational longer than I can remain solvent. So let's go one step further and go down. If we don't bounce to this $2 mark, which is a huge whole number psychology piece, you got to go out to the weekly and look for the next big levels. Well, where are they? It's down here at like 155. And I was like, if we get down to 155, this position is going to be an atrocious loser. And I just couldn't go for that. So I uh, figured the most prudent thing to do is lick my wounds, take this significant loss and move on. Good news is I've got other trades that are, you know, generating me some uh, gains to offset the loss from that natural gas trade. But it is what it is. It's part of the trading world. Got a little bit uh, too far too quick on me and... Unfortunately, didn't get to do what I wanted. I know they, that's what they keep saying, warmer winter, and you know they're going to start stocking up on the reserves and replenish those. Either way, it doesn't matter what was going to happen. There was all money. It's all numbers. So there was a specific dollar amount, and I told myself, that's it. Ain't going past that. And it hit it, pulled the trigger. You know, you, you can't dwell on it. Now, could I jump back into this one and like start selling... You know, if I go back to boil, which again, you probably wouldn't want to do because it's so damn dangerous. Do I, you know, I go out there and start selling the $4 puts or the 350s or the threes? Sure, you could. But what if in some crazy world, what if this not only gets to 150, but what if we have that same sort of storage issue we had with crude or with um, crude oil back in April of 2020? Now, I don't know. I've never seen that before where all of a sudden you were, you know, going negative on um, crude oil. Well, obviously, if natural gas went negative, I'd be in a world of hurt in that position, and I just didn't want to take that chance. So bailed on it, call it a day, and, you know, I think normally stop loss would have been much quicker, right? That's the surrendering on the trade. Now, I wanted this one to have some action. I wanted this one to have some time to breathe and to move because I know it's in a, in a pretty aggressive down move and trying to catch that falling knife, you know, always a dangerous prospect. So wanted just to share that with you. I know some of you are in that trade as well. Better watch yourselves on this one. I mean, you know what? It's probably right now, it's probably your chance to buy it because what did I just do? I just got out of the trade. So maybe you got go long on it now because I'm out and I'll have a huge rally from here on out. Storage is more expensive. Yeah, I don't I don't follow that. You know, when we talked to John Rowland last week, he said, you know, it's possible, but the odds are very, very slim of that same issue happening with natural gas. Uh, the March 3rd, $4 puts are paying 7% premium. You want to take that chance? There you go, Big Gab. I mean, look, I did not think it would fall from seven to sub five in four days. That was uh, an absolute shock to me. Yeah, you know, and Big Gab, look, that's the thing. There's this, I told you, there's this one ass clown. I hate to be rude, but she's the dumbest person I think I've ever heard of in my life. She's brilliant because she knows how to create sensationalism on her Twitter feed. And all she does is say, I'm the greatest person ever. I bought this stock at $2 and it's now $50,000 a share. I'm a genius. I'm rich. I'm a millionaire. Follow me. Subscribe to my newsletter. You know, those are the donkey of the days, right? These are the ones that if... If I mention her name, you'll probably all go look her up, and I hope you don't because I hope this clown gets what's coming to her. I hope the SEC goes after people like that. But most people don't talk about their losses. In this case, you know, you guys have been following along on this natural gas trade. I figured I'd let you know what's going on with that one. And uh, we are officially out of that trade with uh, a bit of a bruise on it. So, yep, surrendered. I threw in the towel, and it's just it has to be done because I just don't know how low natural gas is going to go. I'm pretty sure almost everybody here would believe, as I do, there's no way that natural gas is going to zero. It's, there's no way it's going to zero, right? I said the same thing with crude oil. And like I said, when it hit negative $41 a barrel, I, I just couldn't believe what I was seeing. It's like I saw, literally saw a ghost. 
Um, <laughs> well, I, uh, Falgebra, you know, you said I had less than, oh, you missed, you deleted it, um, you know, less than 120 boil. Look, it's all about money, right? If, if, if the losses that you have on boil are okay with you, then fine. But my, my concern here is that these things will be considering dropping, it'll con, uh, considering continue dropping lower and lower and lower just because that's where the momentum is. It feels like there's just algorithmic selling going on. I mean, look at this price chart. This is just insane looking at natural gas on, let's say, the daily. I mean, there's been not even a breath of air. It hasn't even come close to making a higher high for the last four days and just been ripping. And, and, and honestly, the way that today finished, it looks like it's going to go uh, lower even faster because it's pulling harder. You can see how big that red candle was today. That's not good. So yeah, I had to bail on it. At some point, I might jump back into it, but right now, I, I personally won't do that. And the reason for that is this. When you take a pretty, uh, and this one is is not like a major major loss. It's it's certainly uh got some got some weight to it, but if you incur a big loss on something, there's an emotional attachment normally for most people. I've managed to dis disconnect from that, but I know a lot of novices and people who are starting out struggle because you have this belief that you're going to get it back, and you almost force it to get it back. You start doing things you normally wouldn't do, and then all of a sudden you find yourself in a much deeper hole. So. Just move on, find something else. We'll, I'll, I'll be watching Natural Gas. It's on all my watch list, but we'll have to leave that one alone. Uh, what did I see here? I think you want me to trade. I uh, don't work out and stick in it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, not only take heat from from the uh, the position itself, which is the most important part, but taking heat from viewers out there too, because I know some people follow through. Hey, Mike, good to see you. Uh, when was the last time you sold something at the absolute bottom? You normally... <laughs> you normally have pretty good... Well... And that's and that Mike is bringing us a good point because when I look at this price chart, you know my brain's going, I mean, this thing's going to bottom out here any moment, any second. That's gonna, it's got a bottom. And you're right, Mike. There have been times where I have sold the bottom, and normally I don't like to do that, but um, it's not like I was planning on it. I, would, I had a number in place, and that's what I'm basing this trade off of. Is not, oh, I need to pick that bottom. Um, initially, if you look at the trade as it was set up. That's kind of what I was doing. I was looking, thinking the bottom's going to come in right around here around 250, 260. And therefore, that's why I sold those puts where I did. Because I was picking the bottom. So in this case, you know, I really, I, I would say the biggest mistake I made on this trade um, is not the trade itself. That's fine. I'm okay with the trade and everything I've done up to this point. The, the thing that I should have done is I should have gotten out on Friday as it broke down below those lows. So if I have to regret anything on this trade, it's not the loss. It is what it is. Um, it's that I didn't get out on Friday. Now, technically, it didn't hit my stop loss, but just the way it broke down pretty much told me it was going to go lower on Sunday night when it opened up. And last, it's funny, if you guys watched last night, as those futures markets were opening up, I was watching like, oh, man, we're going much lower. So normally, I'm not uh, the first one in the market opens. I was there today to make sure I dumped this thing early on. And I'm kind of happy I did. If you look at the intraday price action, you know, let's look at Boyle. Here's the intraday on Boyle. Now, of course, this gap got me, but I did save a little bit of money by getting out on the open, you know, getting out around 470. And here we are now at 440. So, you know, 30 cents of that was about, uh, what, 6%. We lost another 6% of that trade had I stayed in. So anyway, there you go. Boyle would just be... Uh, Boyle would be just merging stocks. I thought it was that they what they usually do. Uh, well, they'll reverse split if it gets too low. They'll reverse if it gets too low. But you look at what happened with um, let's go to uh, UCO or USO, right? So USO is the crude oil ETF, and you can just see what happened if we're going to try to do apples to apples kind of comparison here. Let's go back into 2020 when we had that negative 20 print, right? Or negative 41 dollar print. It went all the way down to 17. So it didn't go zero, and the reason for that is they're rolling the futures contract. So they were constantly rolling. They weren't holding that one specific, uh, it was the March contract, right? I believe it was the March contract. Um, if you had the March contract and you held it to expiration, you were forced to take delivery. So what USO does is it, it's gonna roll to the next contract. It's not gonna hold that, right? So that's what um, NG is gonna do. NG is not gonna be holding to anything to expiration. It's constantly gonna be rolling so there's no no threat of it going negative like that because it's going to have the futures uh, the front contract. And again, natural gas or uh, crude oil went negative because of a storage issue. And the next contract, as soon as it opened, was you know up in that fifteen twenty dollar range. So there you go. Um, I thought it was one of the rules. OTA is don't try to catch a falling knife. Uh, no, that's not true. 
one of the rules of OTA is don't just arbitrarily try to pick a falling knife. If you're picking a, if you're catching a falling knife into an area of strong demand, fine, because that's where if you've measured it out, use the odds enhancers there, in your mind, there's a high probability of it bouncing at that point. Arbitrarily saying, oh, this is the bottom? Yeah, that's stupid, right? But looking and saying, oh, there's a demand zone here, I'm expecting there to be a bounce, wrapping your supply and demand zone around that level and using that as your stop loss, that's the way it works. Um, oh, it is what it is, stocks. It's, it's, it is what it is, just trading, you know. Uh, yep, will ETF actually go to zero? It could. Rajesh as Rajesh says, it could. I don't believe that it will because what they'll do is they'll just reverse split it. They'll just keep reverse splitting and reverse splitting and reverse splitting. And because Boyle is based off of the natural gas ETF, that's going to be rolling constantly. So you won't get the negative print, but you could get reverse splits on it, especially since Boyle is currently trading at four bucks, right? Anything under five bucks puts it in threat of being delisted. Go back to current market. There you go. Anyway, um, just wanted to share that one with you guys. It's, uh, it was a little bit rough, but, you know, again, it's just part of trading. So let's walk through what some of the other bad stuff out there. Hey, Pepe, good to see you. No worries. You missed, you missed the, the pain and suffering on my part. <laughs> uh, let's walk you through the economic calendar just so we can take a peek at what happened out there today. You know, there was actually some decent news around the world. You can see that Germany, their flash services numbers were better. Same thing for the EU as a whole. Their services were better. Manufacturing were just slightly down. The UK actually had much better services numbers. You can see that up here near the top. Um, the ZEW economic sentiment report came out much better. So, you know, Europe posting some fairly good news and I guess not, not announcements, but economic data for their respective economies. And they didn't really rally today. You actually have had a continued downtrend on the euro against the dollar. You get down into uh, the US stuff, or Canada, of course, it was in line with most of their expectations, except the core retail sales. Uh, for US, you had your flash manufacturing and services numbers, and those were slightly better on both fronts. So you start the day off with positive news. Now, there was a comment that came through. Actually, let me get past that comment, start here. Um, there was actually earnings announcement before the market opened. Walmart with a pretty big beat, WMT, uh, they beat by 12.5% on their earnings and only up 0.61%, but you had juggernauts like Home Depot, which also beat earnings down 7%. Palo Alto Networks, uh, didn't see their numbers, but it says they were, uh, yeah, they didn't release theirs yet, uh, what is it, when I took the screenshot, and Medtronic. So those are your companies that reported earnings, but really, from the get-go, as Skilled Stocksman said here just a minute ago, this was a beautiful trending day. This is a momentum trader's dream type of day. Here's your five-minute. You know, it was pretty much down Periscope all day, a couple small little bounces, but really everything just dropping and dropping, dropping on the day. So great for anybody who has momentum. That was not me today. Uh, this is going to be an extremely busy week, so I won't be doing much day trading at all. Maybe next week I'll get back to some of that. So anyway, I want to throw that economic data on there real quick. The other parts here that are interesting, we saw the dollar index today, nothing really dramatic, but it is still, you know, looks like it still could continue on from that upside move breakout that we had. I'm just, and again, I'm going to leave these this bullish flag pattern here to see if it does come to fruition. Normally, just for anybody who is into patterns here, if you do get a breakout on a bullish flag, as we saw here happen well, I'll say it happened on February 10th. Usually, you would expect there to be a much more uh, significant upside move. In this case, it is moving up, but not with the, the force and thrust that I thought it would, which would normally be right here, right? Like the first three leading into the flag pattern, you would think it would have left with that momentum. It did not. And right now, the target for me is still 105 on the dollar index, which uh, we'll, we may get there soon. And then lastly, your, ten, your, your bond market. So you see... Yesterday, big surge up in the bond markets. We actually broke out of the highs we established back in December. So your next stop on the bond market is going to be about that 4.33%. I'm actually working on a, um, a class right now on, with some friends. I am, I'm uh, doing a personal finance class for a group of friends in my living room, which I think is kind of funny, um, but it's fun. And one of the things we're going to talk about tomorrow in tomorrow night's class is you know debt and bonds and interest rates. And I'm doing a really cool comparison looking at how much a house would cost you if you signed a 30-year fixed rate mortgage at the low, which was 2.5? And then what would it be if you got it at 5%? Because we're well above five now, right? And Naum, I think you're here. You know, Naum was like, man, I was so bummed. I didn't get, you know, the 2.5 or 2.2, 30-year fix. I'm only locked in at a 2.87. You should pat yourself on the back right now. If you're locked in at a 30-year in, in a fixed rate mortgage at under 3%, I want you to just take your right hand or left hand, whichever one you are, give yourself a pat, pat in the back, go, that a boy, that a girl. 
good job because you're never, I don't think you're going to see rates like that for a long time. So what I did in this comparison is said, if you had a 2.5% mortgage, a 5%, and then current rates are 7% right now, we're back to 7%. It's actually 6.9 if you have an 800 credit score. So what are those rate differences? And I mean, the amount of interest you're paying more just by going from 2.5 to 5% and then to 7, it's unbelievable. You could buy a brand new home with the interest alone that you're being charged by those interest rates. So anyway, I think that the, the moral of the story there is it's pricing people out of the markets. And I do think we're going to get back up to this um, this bond market, bond yield getting to 4%. Yeah, that's right. You see, right, Chase says 10 year moving up to 4%. Yeah, I think 4.5 is in play. We talked about that a while back. Let me put up the weekly here. We talked about 5% being the next logical target. Or was it 5? Yeah, because that's kind of this, this area back here in 2007 when it really ripped down. Well, that was that overhead supply level. You had a little double top and then it screamed down. So that tells me most likely to come back to those levels. So I think 5% is definitely in play. And remember, if we get to 5%, that means we are probably looking at an 8% or more 30-year fixed rate mortgage, which is going to keep pricing more and more people out of the market. That is going to hurt the housing market. Now, there's a lot of housing market data coming out next week, but I'll talk about that maybe on tomorrow's show. So let me go into just list our questions here. Um, this is not Sean Reed. There we go. Uh, Naum says, with the market looking forward and the bearish sentiment, do you think we will have a recession worse than 2008? Hmm. That's a real, I mean, pure speculation, my gut would tell me no. And I think the, the issue with 2008 was we had this completely over leveraged housing market facilitated by liar loans and no sign mortgages, just said you have a pulse, no jobs, you know, that's fine. You can get, so that was just an, a ridiculous thing that happened that should never have happened ever. The Fed putting all the money into the economy, I think to some extent, and I'll get some pushback here from some of you, I think for, to some extent it should have happened because you did need to add some stimulus. Now there is some people who exploited that. There's this clown down here in Orange County who uh, is now going to prison because he was, he was going to all these businesses and filling out these applications for TARP money or PPP money, uh, and he got millions of dollars just pocketed himself, buying himself all kinds of cars, didn't even run the businesses, just using the business's name. There's a lot of that stuff out there, um, fraud and, and deceptive crap that happened because of all that giveaway, but some money should have been doled out to help out in certain situations. I don't think it's enough to put us into a, a recession like we saw in 20, 2008, um, but I don't know. You know. There's a lot of other factors to this one. That one was predominantly a credit bubble and a housing bubble. This is an equity market bubble, a bond market bubble, and I think the biggest threat out of all those things to me is automation. You know, I did that special on AI the other day because I really do think that in the next three to five years, we're all going to be hearing about AI replacing aspects of our jobs and replacing workers. And I think that'll ultimately be a, a big conundrum is how does the Fed and our government fix that kind of issue when companies are responsible to shareholders and turning a profit? So, you know, in my mind, the only way you can really survive an AI influx in the world and taking over your job is to buy the companies that are using AI to make themselves more efficient because they'll have more money for it and you'll capitalize on the gains. <laughs> Sounds kind of weird to say, but that's kind of how my mind's looking at it. Um, I think that's going to be your biggest factor in the next few years. <laughs> you don't think so, Algebra? You don't think? Okay. I mean, it's fine. But I don't think we'll have one worse than 2008. Again, I think that the Fed is going to continue to prop up these markets and kind of push, push, push. Automation replacing jobs for me. No, no, no. I know that. Oh, of course it is. But I'm saying the AI component is going to be much more severe. Automation typically replaced things like assembly line workers, right? That type of, you know, that type of robotic that can be easily replaced. Not an HR department, not an IT department, not a finance department. But now with the algorithms and intelligent AI systems, you can replace IT, you can replace HR. There are actually publicly traded companies that do that right now. Robert says, well, AI replace trading. I would contend that it, it probably already is. Now, we'll always have, being the smaller traders that you and I are, I think we have an advantage. It's the big fish that are the ones that are going to have problems, right? There's no AI that's going to come after and, and hunt my stop losses for 1,000 shares or 10 contracts of something. But if I'm an institution, I'm trading 500,000 shares, those algorithms will sniff that one out, see it, and, and trade against that. So it'll be more of a competition for institutional traders, I think, against AI. But I think that AI is going to replace a lot more jobs that it couldn't before. You know, just, just to throw in chat, um, uh, mid-journey right? Normally I could go and I could create my own graphics for this show. I could hire an artist every day. Instead, I use an artificial 
AI program, and this was created in 60 seconds. Took a picture, kind of looks like me. Uh, I said, I want a white flag, somebody's surrendering, uh, in, a, in a world of pain, I think is what I put in there. And I have graphics for it. So who have I just replaced? I've replaced a graphic designer. Sorry, Raphael. I know my buddy Raphael is pissed at this whole thing, but it is what it is. And I think it's going to get worse and worse and worse. Um, Double-edged sword, right? It's going to get worse and worse with regards to AI in every aspect of our lives. But it's, in some areas, it'll make it even better and better for us. Just Keep that on your radar and think, how am I going to capitalize on the AI thing? Because it may come after our jobs regardless of what we do. You know, I mean, Robert, I guess as someone who's been in the trading world for so long, one of the things I love to do is educate on trading. Well, do you think that AI could replace me as an instructor? Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Thanks, Big M. Uh, what AI graphics program do I use? Uh, there's a bunch. I tried about a dozen of them. When one of my friends mentioned this this graphics stuff, I, I tried about a dozen of them. The best one, hands down, Midjourney. Midjourney.io. It's pretty pretty good stuff. How much do you pay? Uh, I pay $24 a month, and I can do unlimited graphics. I mean, it's funny. You guys could tell me anything, and I could have it create the graphic. Unfortunately, I don't have Discord on here. I don't think I downloaded Discord here. One second. No, I didn't. I'll put Discord on this computer so I can show you guys later on. Um, I'll just, one day I'll just have you guys each type in a word and I'll take all, whatever the first five words are and uh, we'll create a graphic off that. Um, AI has done a pretty good job on career diagnosis. Oh, cancer diagnosis? Good. Hey man, if we can come up with a vaccine for COVID in under six months, how can we have it come up with a cure for cancer in 30, 40, 50 years? Uh, I started a call about Bill Gates and some elected officials saying robots should be taxed just like human employees. That would be interesting. I don't know. That's a that's a totally different level there. But should they? You know, part of me says no. The robot is not earning an income. The robot's not earning an income. Now, you could argue that it's replacing a job and therefore it needs to be. But, but should we rep then should we tax PCs and computers for taking a lot of the processing away from other jobs that were there? I don't know. Um have to do a poll on that one. I don't know. I don't think that they should be taxed, which is why I'm thinking, um, how do we capitalize on it? If companies are going to use AI to make their businesses more profitable, then you need to buy the stocks of those companies. That, that's the way my brain thinks about it. Tom says, um, trading survived from a bunch of guys yelling in the pit and transitioned to computer-based trading, and there's a lot more people trading. Yes. So when we had the rules change, basically in the late 90s, so it was 90. I believe it was 94, you had Harvey Houtkin and the whole Soz Bandit thing, which opened the door to you and me, trading our own security, trading directly to a market maker for 1,000 shares or less. Before that, some of you old schoolers, I uh, talked with Michael Russo on Saturday, some of you old schoolers out there, you might have to wait 20, 30, 40 minutes, an hour to get a response back from your broker that they made a trade for you. Why? Because they were doing all this stuff uh, without the electronic marketplace. They really weren't doing anything for you. You could have done it directly, and that allowed us to communicate with market makers. That was 94. 98, the SOS rules changed, which now allowed um, the, the ECN rules changed, which allowed you and me to go directly to institutional electronic communication networks. And that allowed us to post bids and asks, negotiate our own prices in the marketplace. And from that, tons of new trading came in. And this market will continue to evolve, as Tom points out. You know, we have come a long way from Buttonwood Tree and Wall Street to, um, you know, high frequency trading and algorithms. I don't know if I'll go full algorithm any day, but uh, I, I like to do it the manual way and I think we'll always be fine. Is AI, AI managing bug with coding? So it's funny, you know, one of the things I talk about in the crypto program uh, was you have one of the biggest threats in cryptocurrencies is actually how well the smart contracts are written, right? A smart contract is just a document, piece of code that outlines all the rules for a specific transaction or structure of a business or anything like that. So if that code is written wrong, Somebody who's smarter, it's always a Russian hacker, right? It's always a Russian hacker. Russians seem to have the smartest hackers in the world, uh, according to the media. Uh, but it's always a Russian hacker will find some vulnerability and then steal the money out of that crypto project. That is one of the major risks. And you can actually go to ChatGPT, put in the smart contract code and say, find the flaws with this code. I've seen somebody do that. That was pretty cool. So AI is only as smart as the data input sets. So there's certain sets of data that get input into that computer or in, in, into that program, if you will, and it runs based off that. And it will get better and learn based off of conditioning and reaction. So if I do this, this happens, correct it. This, this happens, it's better. Um, is it coded? 
I think that there is certainly some element of it, but I'm not an AI expert, so I can't. I, I plead the fifth. Um, are robo trading successful? If so, why would there exist a fund manager, and why can't we beat trading robos? If I can't beat the markets consistently by a good margin, so. So the reason that you're not going to beat those is typically when you have robo trading, there's fees associated with it. So they'll charge you, you know, whatever, two, three percent per year in order to use their system. But basically all it is is just a consensus model portfolio that says, oh, you're this old, you have these objectives and it will just trade accordingly and build your portfolio. It depends if it's active or passive investment portfolio, uh, robo, but all that stuff you can do yourself. I just don't get it. If you, and if, most fund managers and hedge funds managers can't beat the market, so just buy the S&P. ChatGPT finds the code for copy and paste. Yep, exactly. So ChatGPT will write the code. You can put you can put in to ChatGPT, here's the code for the smart contract, evaluate it for errors, and it will find you errors. Uh, da -da -da. Yep. Yeah, it's funny. I mean, it was, so I have a couple friends who are using um, ChatGPT to help write their code, and they're finding flaws in the code that was written. Now, remember, ChatGPT is just simply going over to something like GitHub and pulling the code from there. Anyway, we're going too deep on AI and uh, coding. There was a couple. I want to get to Oliver. So Oliver says, if bond yields continue to go higher, that TLT ETF uh, will opportunity for shares and call options, correct? I'm not quite sure I understand the question there, Oliver, but let me see if I can explain uh, my interpretation of it. So you talked about TLT. So here's TLT, and this is on a weekly time frame. Remember, TLT is going to be the opposite of bond yields. So as bond yields increase, which if you look at here, I believe that bond yields will continue to increase and go higher. I think we're going to go to 5% probably in the next few months. If we get there, then that means that TLT is going to fall. So if you're looking at it, saying, hey, I want to you know, buy TLT, careful. Because again, if those yields keep going up, TLT is going to continue to drop, right? And maybe thing, maybe, you know, you could use puts and calls, but just remember the strategy. If you're looking at TLT, the odds are better at this point that TLT is going to continue to slide down because you have the 10-year bond yields are rising. And as those continue to rise, the price of TLT should go down. So that's the basics of it. Uh, you know, if you want to buy TLT lower, you can sell some puts on it. But again, you're selling puts on something that's clearly in a downtrend and dropping, just like I did with my natural gas. So don't call me. I can't be a hypocrite on this one. <laughs> um, let's see. Da, 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 da. What else? I think that was all the two questions I had. All right. Well, that was that was my two questions. If you have some more, send them on in there. Let's see. Uh, before adding new taxes, one would hope that they agree on how to spend our money more efficiently. Well, you and I can agree on how we should spend our money more efficiently, but our politicians will not. They will not. It will continue to go back and forth. Um, oh, you want to go? You want to go to uh, crypto mining stocks, huh? Mara and Riot. Oh boy, sure, why not? So here you got Riot blockchain on a weekly. Uh, let's go back to a daily. I like it on daily. Get that line out of there. So here's your Riot blockchain on a daily Riot platforms. It says it should be Riot blockchain. That's kind of weird. And then they change their names now to platform. I thought it was always Riot Blockchain. Um, technically, Katut, I, I don't like it. I mean, it's just chopping sideways here. Simple thing to do. Just wrap some lines around this bad boy and say, okay, if it gets out of that range, then I'm happy maybe going long above. Uh, it looks to be about $7.75. Right? Of course, $8 would be a psychological one. But, you know, it's already had its huge run from 3 bucks to 6 It's up 100% in just a couple of weeks. And, and why is that? That's predominantly because of Bitcoin and what's been going on with Bitcoin. Uh, but Bitcoin's not out of the woods yet, right? You saw that Bitcoin took a little bit of a tank today or started started tanking. Let me show you that one because of what happened with um, Coinbase's earnings. So here is Bitcoin right now down 2.11%. I have too many colors on this chart here. Let me get rid of some of this stuff. That's my four-year cycle. So how do I do that? Dang it. I didn't want to delete this one, but I will. All right, so there's your, your Bitcoin price chart. And we've had this really nice kind of stair step up. I was hoping it would have rallied a little bit more. Still see it coming back and pulling back lower just because of what's been going on with cryptocurrency and all the issues with Gary Gensler. Of course, this guy become, become just evil going after all crypto stuff. Um, the reason that you saw Riot run like that is because of this. Bitcoin jumped, and this is from January, was down to 16,000. Now you're at 25,000. Huge pop. 
Of course, that's going to directly impact the mining companies, which I thought I had it there. There you go. Uh, there's Riot. So that was the big jump. It hasn't done anything since. So if crypto keeps rallying, you'll do fine with these ones. Nah, I wouldn't call that head and shoulders, but Rob, this is just chop. I mean, if this is a head and shoulders, that person needs to see a chiropractor real bad. Uh, you can look at Mara. She's going to have a similar picture, right? They all had that big run. They were up 207%. So Bitcoin rallies from $16,000 to $25,000, and this thing goes up 200%. Pretty impressive. Uh, but if it doesn't keep going up, their profit margins are not going to go up anymore. All right, so what was the other one you wanted there? I don't know the other one. CLSK. Oh, yeah, I know. Uh, again, similar picture. So all these, these uh, mining, crypto mining platforms, my concern earlier on was that they were going to go bankrupt. And that's because crypto was on this down periscope for so long. If that kept on going, you know, they're going to start going under. And you heard a lot about um, different crypto mining companies going under, right? There were a few that filed for bankruptcy, a couple that were merged into others. I think at one point there was like 24 publicly, publicly traded crypto mining companies. I think that number has now switched, uh, has shrunk a little bit due to some consolidation. Um, the Igor head and shoulders, that's right. <laughs> So yeah, I'm not a big fan of the crypto miners right now. Yeah, they're cheap. You know, is it is it worth buying it at, at three bucks? I would love to rather buy it, buy it at a buck sixty, but I don't know. I just don't have as much confidence in the mining companies. And one of the main reasons is they lost a lot of their revenue because you had mining companies making money off of Ethereum. They're no longer making money off Ethereum because it's no longer a proof of work algorithm, right? The consensus mechanism for Bitcoin is proof of work. So there's really only a handful of cryptos that they can be mining. They can be mining Bitcoin. They can be mining Dash. They can be mining Litecoin. Uh, let's see, here's Litecoin. This is a proof of work algorithm. And you have things like Monero. But Monero gets you into trouble because it's a privacy coin. And I think a lot of miners are worried that the regulators are going to come after privacy coins. So uh, there's that. And then, again, margins are dropping. There's fewer of them to mine or cryptocurrencies to mine. And... I don't know, I just, I just don't see the longevity there, and especially with the energy consumption issue. If people keep going after energy consumption, and it will be, in 2024, a political platform. Oh, we must do something about the energy consumption by Bitcoin. I saw, I think his name is Dan Held. He's one of the OGs in the crypto space. He, was, he posted some crazy stat like, the US Navy uses 4.6 billion gallons worth of fuel every year for its fleet. Yet Bitcoin's the one that's polluting. That was kind of a funny one. Uh, Zcash, is, is Zcash proof of work? I think, yeah, I think Zcash is proof of work. Not 100% sure on that one, but hey, Don, good to see you. No, no problem, Oliver. And where's, uh, was it Mike? Well, you're the one who always likes the weed stocks, right? I mean, this picture hasn't changed. It, it looked hopeful. Right here, look, just started to look hopeful back in December and then just gave it all back and now drifting lower. So again, I, I just stay out of it until it proves to you that trend has changed. At some point, it will, it will curl back up. You're not going to see the cannabis industry just fold up and disappear. Uh, it's just getting back to a point where the valuations are so low and you have kind of a value play going there. So uh, it looks to me like this one's going to keep going lower. You know, how much lower can it go? Remember, they can do a reverse split. I don't know if they have in the past. Let me look real quick. Yeah, they have not done a reverse split yet. But uh, MJ may do a reverse split here soon because it's under 5 bucks, And, of course, a certain period under $5 will put them on the D-list notice and they'll be delisted. So they'll probably do a you know 10 for 1 reverse split and all of a sudden you'll come in and go, holy cow, MJ's at $40. No, it was at $4 and they did a 10 to 1 reverse split. So that's typically what happens out there with those. All right, let me go to your economic calendar for manana. Congratulations on those Chiefs, Don. That was a heck of a game. I was cheering for them. I'm first first time in a while I've been cheering for the Chiefs. And and I, it's funny because I think that if Mahomes can continue to stay healthy, he's been injured a bit, he'll beat Brady as the GOAT. And I, I'm much I'm looking forward to that one. I can't stand Tom Brady. Sorry for the Patriots fans out there. I don't know why. I just cannot stand Tom Brady. Anyway, here's what's cooking for tomorrow. 22nd, according to Zach. You've got a pretty big one. I may, I may actually even go in one step and call this thing the popcorn trade of the day. Now, the reason I call this a popcorn trade of the day is because it's NVIDIA, all right? You've got NVIDIA reporting earnings. That's going to be aftermarket close. Same with network appliances and Mosaic Company. You have Baidu and TJ Maxx reporting uh, before market opens tomorrow. So if you look at NVIDIA, bring up that chart for y'all. 
there's your NVIDIA chart. And you know this, this company is phenomenal. I actually, I think I told you guys, I know a guy, to give you an idea of where AI is headed. Let's just let's sprinkle on some AI stuff here. I got a buddy of mine who works for AI and he is in the integration into sports. And I, I like certain announcers. I, I never liked Tony Romo as a football player, but I think as a football announcer, I love what he does to the game. He dissects plays. He's like, oh, here's a quarter wing slant with a half big hitch. And watch the, watch the center right here. He's gonna pull to the right. And that safety, if he doesn't bite, they're gonna throw here. And man, how come he couldn't be that accurate on the football field? But he, that guy knows this stuff. So I like listening to Tony Romo as an NFL broadcaster because he gives me insights in the game I've never heard. I also love Joe Madden. I don't like Joe Buck, right? Joe Buck, I can't stand the guy. So imagine, and this is what the guy told me. He goes, ESPN cannot afford an $80,000 a year broadcaster to do collegiate volleyball or collegiate softball, right? Just can't, can't do it. So what they've done is they now have the sensors and mechanisms in place to identify the players on the field where the AI can read ground ball to this, to this position and they'll know in the database, here's who that position is. Okay, great. Knows the throw and all that stuff. So it will be able to broad announce the games, not just in college sports, but at some point it will be professional level. And imagine this. Imagine it got to the level where you're watching an NFL game. You log in. I'm watching the 49ers play the, the Chiefs for the next Super Bowl, and I've got a nice wager with Don Fron because his team's going to get their butt kicked in the Super Bowl against the Niners if they actually play a real team with defense. Um, but what if I wanted to hear Joe Madden announce the game? In the future, I'll be able to click on the Joe. Pick your announcer. You want Kanye West to announce for Or Snoop Dogg would probably be hilarious as an NFL commentator. But you'd be able to select the announcer that you want, whoever your favorite was, and it'll do it in their voice and all their canter. And you can speed up. How much color commentary do you want? I don't want much. Just let me hear the game or just fill it with all the jokes and banter you guys can do. That's where AI is going. And NVIDIA is pioneering a lot of that technology right now. So I, it makes me more bullish on NVIDIA. But uh, after this, look at this chart right here. This thing, since September of last year, has gone from about 110 to 230. Hell of a run. So I, I'm really curious to see what happens with their earnings announcement. That's going to get be after market close. Nothing not like a $500 billion. Please, please. No way. You, you would not have made it past us, dude. No way. You couldn't have beat our defense. You guys were struggling with, uh, you were struggling with the, the Eagles defense, which was pretty good. But their offense was... Jalen Hurts, the guy ran for three touchdowns. See, our quarterback's not going to be running. We, we have receivers. Anyway, uh, they do it with voiceovers now, but Oliver, I think it's, it'll be so much more robust that when you log into your TV, watch Sunday Night Football, just a couple clicks, like, like I don't even want to hear an announcer. Just let me watch the game with the natural sounds. Just strip that out. Or, you know, give me Joe Buck and Tony Romo doing the game. And, and you can do it for anything. I think it's phenomenal. And that, that is the future. It's coming down the road. Uh, let's see, Oliver says... This is what Navy vet at the gas station told me that they were, use all that energy for ships and they walk to his car and said, <laughs> uh, when you start on trade, never. Remember, you're not wrong. The market is wrong. Oh, wow. Yeah, do, nobody listen to Don on that one. Don, don't contaminate our viewers here. You're, gonna, you're starting to sound like uh, Jim Cramer. Jim Cramer says, never use stop losses. <laughs> Anyway, all right, I got your economic out of the way. I got your earnings calendar out of the way. I am going to retire for the evening. I hope you guys uh, have a good good night. Um, if you want something specific covered tomorrow, just put it down below any YouTube video. I'll get to that one tonight or tomorrow and, and map those ones out, give you a show on what you guys want. Tomorrow will be the last show for the week because I'm gone Thursday, Friday. So you can email me at tradermerone at gmail.com. Let me know what you want me to discuss for tomorrow. That said, I will see you all tomorrow. Take care, everybody.